Welcome, dear listeners, to an adventure of transformation and self-discovery. Today we journey into a realm where the mind is the canvas and thought is the brush, shaping our reality. Prepare to see the world and yourself in a new light. Imagine standing at the entrance of an ancient castle, not built from stone but from the essence of the human spirit. This castle represents mental poverty, a state where doubt and despair hinder personal greatness. But don't worry. James Allen has crafted a key to unlock these barriers and reveal the secrets within. Overcoming mental poverty is more than just a text. It's a voyage through timeless wisdom and mystical insights where each idea is a gem waiting to be uncovered. As we explore this illuminated castle, we will learn to transform doubt into confidence, fear into freedom, and discover the true treasure within ourselves. Each chapter is a new room, each lesson a revelation, Guiding us toward the boundless power of a flourishing mind, Alan will lead us through the secrets that empower individuals globally to unlock their highest potential, live with purpose, and achieve success and abundance. So, put on your headphones, close your eyes, and prepare for a transformative experience. The journey starts now as we watch the castle of mental poverty crumble and unveil a landscape of endless possibilities. Order, this fourth pillar called order, makes understanding possible and tells us that in the vast natural and universal system, everything has its place and function, which makes the universe operate in harmony. Just as chaos would destroy the universe as we know it, disorder would destroy our affairs, projects, and aspirations for prosperity. Every complex organism is built from order. No business or organization can mature without order. It is a principle that directly concerns the businessman, the governor, the entrepreneur, and the administrator. There are areas in which a disorganized person may achieve mediocre success, but they will never triumph in business without using systematic order, that is, a system that remedies their flaws and optimizes their abilities. All great enterprises have evolved by following defined systematic lines, the violation of which would be disastrous for efficiency and well-being. Structured enterprises are built like natural organisms, attentive to every detail. Generally, the disorganized person is only focused on the main goal and neglects details and means. Organisms perish in disorder, and by ignoring details they frustrate their growth process. Disorganized individuals waste enormous amounts of time and energy searching for things and expending energy. The time spent searching for things and the energy wasted could have allowed them to achieve great success, the irritation and bad mood caused by this search use as much energy as is needed to build a business or climb a mountain. Organized individuals save time and energy, never lose anything, and therefore never need to find anything again. Everything is in its place, and they can find things even in the dark. They can afford to be practical and thus channel their energy into something more profitable than blaming others for their disorder. Order involves a certain touch of ingenuity, even genius, as it allows for problem-solving. A systematic person can work many hours, accomplish several tasks simultaneously, and yet does not seem to tire as others do. They advance on the road to success while their competitors can't even find the shortcuts. Their respect for order enables them to achieve their goals without setbacks. Order in all branches of business requires work and sacrifice, like the vows of a saint, and cannot be violated in any way. In the world of finance, Order is an unavoidable necessity, and those who adhere to it save time and money. All societal success is based on order, so progress would be impossible without it. Think, for example, of literature, the classics written by brilliant authors, their poems and dramatic works. Think of human relationships, their religions, their normative bodies, and their bibliographic production. Finally, consider that these works would not exist without an orderly system of letters, numbers, sentences, and linguistic codes. Similarly, the wonderful achievements of mathematics have emerged from a systematic order. The most complex machine in the world, both in its parts and its accessories, operates because it adheres to the order of formulas, numbers, and mathematical laws. The system simplifies what is complex, makes easy what was difficult, connects details together and ensures that everything functions in a way that can be explained without confusion. The astronomer classifies the elements of the universe, from microscopic organisms to stars, using his classification system, 
allowing him to quickly locate any object and organism among millions of referenced elements. This classification ability is impressive and saves humanity immense amounts of time and labor. There is an order for religious, political and commercial systems. We can say that society is bound and interconnected by this adhesive called order. Order is indeed one of the principles of progress and unity. It is a complete whole formed by millions of individuals who, everywhere and at the same time, struggle and compete to achieve their goals. Order is allied with prosperity. Untrained minds remain stagnant and isolated, while those who understand the importance and scope of the organizing power can establish fixed laws for business. This happens in all areas of life, law, religion, science, politics, mathematics, etc. When two human beings meet, they immediately need a stable framework with fixed rules to communicate and understand each other. Life is too short to live in confusion. Knowledge grows every second, and progress does not admit any form of regression. Those who are accustomed to organizing and systematizing their affairs can also simplify and make them easier. Thus, they can feel freer, less constrained, and make good decisions. Every major enterprise has an order for managing its affairs an order akin to a well-calibrated and compact machine. A businessman, a friend of mine, once told me that he could leave his vast business for 12 months, and upon his return, everything would still be running smoothly. This happens, he said, because each worker knows how to fulfill their obligations, how to use the machines and tools, and how to handle unforeseen events and problems. Nothing is superfluous, nothing is improvised. Lack of discipline and avoidance of conflicts generate no success. People who abhor discipline, whose minds are ungovernable and careless, can neither be successful nor prosperous and saturate their lives with worries, problems and difficulties which would disappear if they managed their lives better. An undisciplined mind is a mind without order and in the race of life it could not achieve much against a methodical and orderly person. It is like an overweight person trying to beat an athlete who trains daily. The undisciplined mind considers any resource useful, regardless of whether it is bad or mediocre. In contrast, the disciplined person believes that only acquiring and surrounding themselves with the best will allow them to achieve their goals. The person who, while doing their work, cannot find their tools, organize their accounts, or open their office, will waste time while their competitor advances by leaps and bounds. The businessman whose method is negligent is behind compared to expert minds. He will have no choice but to blame himself for his negligence and lack of self-discipline and will need to make great efforts to learn new techniques of order and efficiency. Similarly, he will need to leverage anything that helps save time and thus become more meticulous. Everything is built by order, from organisms and stars to people and businesses, step by step, cell by cell, thought by thought. Things take shape and either complete or disappear. Those who improve their methods gain construction power. Therefore, it is up to the individual to perfect their methods. Builders, whether constructing cathedrals or businesses, are indispensable in society and have always been pioneers in their respective nations. The systematic builder is a creator, while the disorganized one destroys. Powers cannot be entrusted to a person unless they have first acquired order and discipline to study and classify every detail. The powerful classify with efficiency and perfection, allowing them to examine even the smallest detail of their work. Order is composed of these four elements. 1. Availability. 2. Precision. 3. Usefulness. 4. Completeness. Availability means being alert to handle any situation. Being orderly helps perfect our availability, like the brave general facing the advance of the enemy. The businessman must be ready to face any unforeseen event that might affect their finances. In general, any intelligent person must be willing to face new problems. Procrastination is fatal and must be avoided at all costs. Active and prepared individuals know what they are doing and do it methodically. They are people who do not need to obsess over prosperity because it comes to them naturally. Precision is of paramount importance in all commercial enterprises. There can be no order without acting with precision and a half-done organization will lead its creator to make half-done mistakes, which will then be difficult to correct. Inaccuracy is a common and ordinary flaw. Precision is related to self-discipline and requires sacrificing oneself to improve. It can be said that very few people truly manage to self-discipline unless there is a voluntary cultivation of self-discipline. 
whether as an employer, subordinate, or head of a family. Flaws will never be corrected, and one will remain stuck in the same place without evolving. In the business world, failing to correct the tendency to err, regarded as a vice, leads to disastrous results in personal development. This means cultivating a set of repetitive behaviours that lead nowhere. Error leads to falsehood. Few people have trained themselves to be precise. Most are ashamed of their mistakes and prefer to lie rather than admit they might be wrong. It is necessary to say that this habit will result in more difficulties and misunderstandings in the long run. Some people strive too hard for precision and end up obsessing so much that they make a multitude of errors out of fear of making mistakes. A person who exhausts themselves trying to correct their own errors, the errors of their employees or the errors of others, ends up performing poorly in their job and mission as an exemplary individual. They become ineffective, an empty perfectionist and fail to prosper further. There is no one in the world who has not made mistakes, but only the capable and intelligent person draws wise conclusions from their mistakes and corrects them promptly. Such a person is open to criticism and, in fact, rejoices when mistakes are pointed out to them. The incapable person never admits their mistakes and gets offended when they are pointed out. The intelligent person learns from their own and others' mistakes, is always willing to apply good advice they receive, and strives for greater precision in their methods. This means continually increasing perfection as they improve as a person through their work and by correcting their mistakes. Usefulness is the result of method and order in work. Fruitful and advantageous results are achieved when one works systematically. If a gardener wants the best produce, it is not enough to sow and plant. They must sow and plant in the right place, measure the water, separate the grain and study the climate. Any work that aims to be fruitful must be done in its time and should not be postponed. Being practical means choosing the most appropriate tools and using them to achieve set goals. Impractical people fill their minds with useless and unreliable theories and waste their time on speculations that, by their very nature, lead nowhere. The person who focuses their ideas on construction and action rather than on mere discourse and chatter avoids falling into unfounded and futile abstractions and dedicates themselves to achieving some good and useful objective. What cannot be applied or demonstrated in reality should be avoided by practical people. Recently, a philosopher friend of mine told me that if one of his theories were to be rejected, he would continue to cling to it because he found it beautiful. If we choose to cling to these beautiful theories that prove nothing, we should not be surprised by our failures or lack of success, as we prove ourselves to be impractical individuals. When the mind replaces excessive theories and abstractions with actions and facts, skills and knowledge increase, whether they are practical or moral. A prosperous person is measured by their usefulness to society. A person is useful by what they do, not by the beautiful theories they cling to. The carpenter makes a chair, the mechanic repairs a machine, and the teacher shapes the intellect of their students. These tasks are foreign to the polemicist, the debater, the charlatan. Those who produce and realize their ideas are the ones who dominate the world. Precision or breadth of vision is the quality that allows a person to handle a large number of tasks and complete them thoroughly. It is an admirable quality that allows one to find and successfully organize the details of each thing. The successful entrepreneur, so to speak, keeps every detail of their business in mind and adapts it to their personal idea of the enterprise. The inventor has mentally visualized every detail of their machine from their knowledge of mechanics and mathematics, thus managing to perfect their invention. The author of a great poem, story or novel has organized the plot of their story and mapped out the lives of their characters and the incidents they will experience. Nothing is improvised. This is the only way to produce a lasting literary work. A vast and well-ordered mind, which harbors an army of details in its depths, can achieve genius if it is not already. Not everyone can become a genius, of course, but everyone can develop their abilities by paying attention to how they organize their ideas. As their intellect expands, their capabilities stand out. These are the four pillars of the Temple of Prosperity. They can support it without any other help. A person who practices the principles of energy, economy, integrity and order will achieve lasting success in their life's work, whatever it may be. If someone demonstrates energy, saves their time and money, cultivates vitality, integrity and practicality, they are much less likely to fail in life. 
The efforts of these people are well directed, so they will be effective and fruitful. They will also achieve a profound independence that inspires respect and success, and will be an example for those who follow them or show weakness in their decisions. A diligent man can lead kings and rulers, but not the petty or the incapable. The scriptures say that he will neither beg nor lament, but will act like someone strong who knows how to recover from adversity. Thus, through the nobility of his character, he will occupy a privileged position and be esteemed by those around him. He will stand firm and not fall in battle. The following are the four central pillars of the Temple of Prosperity. They provide this temple with the finishing touches of beauty and utility, contributing to its appeal, as they belong to the highest moral sphere and thus to the nobility of character. They elevate a person, placing them in a privileged group distinguished by intelligence and charisma. Sensitivity should not be confused with sentimentality, a weakness of character that, like a beautiful flower without roots, quickly fades away without bearing fruit. To be outraged and shed tears for a tragedy occurring abroad is not sensitivity. To protest against the cruelties and abuses that the rich commit against the poor is not sensitivity. What use is this compassion if one is cruel at home, mistreating one's wife and hitting one's children? Tears of pain and empathy for the rest of humanity become mere superficial expressions, manifestations of the worst hypocrisy. Regarding this type of person, Emerson says, Go play with the children in your neighborhood, be kind to your neighbor, be nice to those who work for you, but do not disguise your indolence with false suffering for slaves or the oppressed who live miles away from you. Distant love is abuse at home. A person is recognized by their immediate actions, by their daily way of treating others, not by the sum of their feelings. When a person is petty and selfish, or when their close ones feel relief at not having them at home, then this display of compassion for the world's oppressed turns into pure hypocrisy. In general, sensitive people are prone to tears, though this expression is not bad in itself. Some abuse this form of expression to hide a deep selfishness. Some cry out of sentiment, while others cry because they did not get what they wanted. Sensitivity expresses itself with tenderness and discreetly, and is usually found in kind and distracted people. Sympathetic people are not effusive or agitated, rather they are calm and firm. Their usually impassive behavior is judged as indifferent by prejudices, but those who understand and do not judge know that such people are the first to understand and reach out to their fellow beings. Insensitivity manifests itself through cynicism, sarcasm, and mockery, as well as through false displays of affection and esteem. This deficiency stems from selfishness. Selfishness is connected to ignorance, while authentic affection comes from knowledge. It is common for people to isolate themselves from their fellows, consider themselves perfect, and judge others in the worst way. Sensitivity pulls a person out of this egocentrism and allows them to think and feel as others do. They put themselves in the place of others and try to understand them. As Whitman puts it, I do not ask the wounded person how he feels. I become the wounded person. How impudent to question someone who is suffering. Suffering demands compassionate people, not nosy ones. The understanding man or woman feels suffering in their own flesh and tries to remedy it. To boast or take pride in offering crumbs of understanding is incomprehensible to sensitive people. If someone speaks of their numerous acts of kindness and complains about the mistreatment they received in return, they are only reinforcing their selfishness. Sensitivity, in its deepest sense, involves joining others in their struggles and sufferings and perfecting oneself through understanding others. In a way, it means forgetting oneself and viewing the terrain from different positions. Look with the eyes of others, and thus you will be able to understand men very different from yourself, he said. The poor fascinate me. Their hunger is my hunger, and I am with them in their homes. I suffer from their privations. I wear the rags of the beggar. I become that poor and despised man, Immersing oneself in another's experience, becoming small and seeking to understand them, is a virtue of giants. Showing sensitivity brings us closer to people, spiritually uniting us with them. When they suffer, we suffer. When they rejoice, we rejoice with them. When they are despised and mistreated, we can feel their humiliation and pain. He who is willing to put himself in another's place and help them can never be cynical, and it is very difficult for them to make cruel judgments against their fellows.
To reach this level of sensitivity, one must have gone through many experiences, loved, suffered, and probed the deepest pain. Since it is formed from the deepest emotions, it is free from base emotions like thoughtlessness and selfishness. No one can feel empathy if they have not experienced pain, but pain and sorrow must have been overcome, matured, and ultimately transformed into calm. Having suffered to some extent, and then drawn wise conclusions from that pain, allows one to understand and care for others. Once one has overcome suffering, they become a kind of resting and healing center for the afflicted. Just as a mother feels anguish for a suffering child, a sensitive person feels anguish for those they see suffering. Perhaps this is a very high form of sensitivity, but it is certain that any form of genuine sensitivity is needed everywhere. Just as we are disheartened by petty and cruel people, we rejoice in knowing that there are truly compassionate individuals. Of course, cruel people suffer their own misfortunes, and often, due to these very defects, they end up failing in many areas. A resentful, cold man, devoid of a shred of sensitivity, no matter how competent he may be in his work, will stumble because of his insensitivity. His cruel and unfeeling nature will isolate him from his peers and those immediately around him, reducing his chances of thriving and leaving him alone in his failure. Even in business transactions, demonstrating sympathy is an important factor, as people feel more comfortable with kind and well-mannered individuals, preferring them to arrogant and rigid ones. In all areas where personal contact is essential, the sympathetic person will be favored over others. If a clerk makes a cruel jest or an unkind remark, it will severely damage his reputation and respect, jeopardizing his influence. Even those who admire his good qualities will hold him in lower personal esteem. Similarly, if a businessman professes a religion, people will expect to see the influence of that religion in his business. Worshipping Jesus on Sundays and being cruel and miserly the rest of the week will harm his business and reduce his prosperity. Sympathy is a spiritual language that everyone, including animals, understands and appreciates. Beings and creatures are subjected to suffering, and this experience leads to the unity of feeling we call sensitivity. Selfishness drives one to exploit others, but sympathy drives one to protect others through self-sacrifice. In this self-sacrifice, there is no loss, as the pleasures of selfishness are nothing compared to the benefits of sympathy. It is natural to wonder how a businessman whose goal is to make profits can engage in self-sacrifice. A person can practice self-sacrifice where they are and to the extent they deem appropriate. When someone claims that due to personal or family reasons they cannot adopt a good habit, they are merely seeking excuses for their mistakes. Diligence in business is not incompatible with sacrifice, as devotion to duty, even if that duty is commerce, is not selfishness but can be selfless devotion. I know a businessman who, upon learning that one of his competitors had gone bankrupt, did everything to help him and restore him to business, a magnificent act of sacrifice. The man I am talking about is now one of the most successful and thriving in the country. The most successful commercial traveller I have known was overflowing with kindness and brilliance. He was so naive about commercial tricks that he resembled a newborn. Yet his big heart quickly won him friends in every city he visited. People rejoiced to see him enter their office, store or workshop, not only because of the good cheer he brought with him, but also because his business was solid and reliable. To a large extent, this man succeeded because of his kindness, a kindness so selfless that he would probably deny its existence itself. Being a sensitive and kind person will never hinder success. It is selfishness that ruins. As kindness increases, a person's prosperity also increases. As sympathy becomes ingrained in our character, it extends its influence and enhances both spiritual and material joys. And then here are the four qualities that make up the virtue of kindness. 1. Kindness 2. Generosity 3. Gentleness 4. Intuition. Kindness, when well developed, is a lasting quality. A sudden and sporadic burst is not kindness, even though it is often called so. There is no kindness in praise, for instance, if there has been any form of mistreatment beforehand. Spontaneous love lasts as long as a spontaneous kiss. The best gift loses its value when we know it must be returned. If we perform benevolent acts for someone, and later, due to some passing anger or frustration, we regret and demand a return of the service, it shows our weakness of character. It is also a selfish act, as we have only thought of ourselves, 
true kindness is immutable and does not need any stimulus to manifest. When strong, kindness is offered not only to those we like, but also to those who act against us. If there are things to repent of, they are actions done with arrogance and without any kindness. There are other actions of which no one repents, and those are benevolent actions. The day comes when people regret having been cruel, having said hurtful things. However, when they remember their noble and kind actions, they feel joy and no regret. Cruelty deteriorates a person, degrades their face and features over time, and ruins any success they might have achieved. In contrast, kindness beautifies the character and face of those who practice this virtue. Those who manage to combine their prosperous business with an exemplary character enrich their prosperity through the practice of kindness. Generosity is the companion of kind-heartedness. If kindness is like a loving sister, generosity is like a strong mother. A magnanimous character is always attractive and influential. Greed and pettiness always repel because they are narrow and cold. Kindness and generosity attract friends and close ones. What repels leads to isolation, while what attracts leads to union and success. Giving is as important as receiving. Those who receive and refuse to give are incapable of receiving. It is a universal law. We cannot receive what we have not given, and we cannot give what we have not received. The saints have taught us that giving is a duty because it is a direct path to personal growth. It is a means to achieve altruism and leave selfishness behind. This implies that we recognize our spiritual kinship with our fellow humans and are willing to detach ourselves from our possessions for their benefit. The more a person accumulates, the more they desire and refuse to give up what they have gathered, acting like an animal with its prey. These individuals are so locked in on themselves that, out of sheer selfishness, they refuse to share anything. In A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens portrays the character of Scrooge as this type of miserly, petty and unsupportive man, hated by all. Today, many of the most renowned men in Europe and the United States have distinguished themselves by their ability to part with their wealth. These men, including entrepreneurs, senators, judges, and many who hold significant positions in public administration, who have excelled in their respective fields, give substantial amounts monthly or annually which of course come from their personal income. Until proven otherwise, I have always wanted to believe that these exceptional men have built their fortunes through hard work and not through illicit dealings which are often allegations made by envious or speculative individuals. Though not perfect, they are people who, to a certain extent, are both strong and generous. It is better to avoid any display of envy, pettiness and greed which are very common in this competitive world. For these vices, instead of offering you something beneficial, will steal the little or much you have managed to obtain through effort. By being kind and sharing with those in need, or who are facing financial difficulties, you will work even more in favor of your prosperity. It will be very difficult for someone to refuse to do business with you, or include you in their circle of trusted people. Kindness is one of the most beautiful qualities, there is nothing more satisfying than meeting a kind person, as this quality completely distinguishes them from what is coarse, ugly, and brutal in the world. It can be said that kind and gentle people shine with a special brilliance. However, kindness is not something acquired overnight. It requires great discipline and experience to attain. It is only possible when we have managed to control our most violent, animalistic side that drives us to treat others as enemies. When someone practices a religion or becomes a priest, one of the first prerequisites is to become a peaceful, gentle person, as spirituality demands it. Being aggressive is an insult to cultivated and altruistic individuals. A kind man, whose behavior is always considered, is appreciated regardless of his background. Hostile people like to show in quarrels or disputes how much they can hurt others. Those accustomed to showing kindness never quarrel, never retaliate. And if they ever respond, they do so without falling into provocations, using a conciliatory word that ends up being more effective. Docility is linked to wisdom. It is normal for kind people to be educated, well-mannered and altruistic. The gentleman avoids most conflicts and disturbances that afflict the grumpy. While they tire themselves with futile efforts, he remains calm and serene, and such tranquility and composure are strengths in winning the battle of life. Intuition is the final quality that makes up kindness. An intuitive person is one who perceives things without needing to ask or be intrusive. 
that is, they are capable of understanding through experience rather than argument. Before knowing something, they have already lived or felt it in their experience. The superficial sees the watch and the shoes and thinks they see the person. The intuitive sees the person themselves and does not concern themselves with accessories. Resentment and hatred often arise from a superficial judgment of people. Love develops between people who have previously desired to know each other. Sensitivity or kindness, being pure forms, connect people. Among the authors who have spoken of love, the human heart and sensitivity, William Shakespeare may be the greatest. However, the true Shakespeare, intimate and personal, is not visible in his works. The author intuitively merges with his characters. He learns to become a miserly merchant, a cynical clown, a jealous princess, a vengeful drunkard or a naive soldier. People Shakespeare may have never known but treats with impartiality and without prejudice, as his great literary intuition prevents him from being cruel to them. Prejudices are a barrier between people. It is impossible to understand those we have judged and condemned in our hearts. We only see people as they are when we avoid judging them without knowing them. By realizing this, we can immerse ourselves in the experiences, faults and virtues of others as if we were seers entering a world of shadows. It is not enough to see with the eyes. The compassionate person is one who can see the soul of others. It is like a prophetic habit, and that is why it is so special. Their heart beats in harmony with others. Neither the past nor the future are mysteries to the compassionate. Their discernment understands and accepts the faults of humanity. Understanding elevates a person, makes them free and powerful, just as their lungs inhale air, their mind inhales happiness. They cease to worry about falling into poverty, failing or disappointing, and focus on developing their potential and prosperity. Sincerity. To remain united, society needs trust, believing in one another, and that is where sincerity originates. If the universe had been founded on a lie, deceit or imposture, there would be no truth leading us to a world of mistrust and destruction. Life is healthy and happy due to mutual trust. If we did not trust each other, we could undertake no business or even associate. We would live in caves, fearing to mingle with others. In Timon of Athens, Shakespeare shows us the miserable condition of a man who has lost faith in humanity. He self-excludes and ends up committing suicide. Emerson says that without trust in the market, society would collapse. Humans by nature place their trust in each other. Payment is made only after the work has been done, a market principle as old as the invention of writing. This system has endured for centuries and shows that people pay their debts and fulfill their obligations because they trust the other party in the market. Despite its flaws, society rests on a solid foundation of truth. True leaders are individuals of superior, undeniable sincerity, and the human race ensures that their achievements are not forgotten or perish, but are cherished and passed on to future generations. It is easy for impostors to imagine that the world is like them and to speak of the decay of society. Can something decayed persist through the ages? All are smugglers to the pirate. Those who see nothing good in human society should examine themselves. Their problem is within them. They have focused so much on evil that they cannot distinguish good. To them, everyone is bad. Society is rotten from top to bottom, a friend told me and asked if I thought the same. I replied that I did not, of course. Society has many flaws, I said, but it is solid like a tree and has truly perfect seeds. Indeed, society is as solid as a tree. Selfish people, just like unripe fruit, do not thrive and end up being rejected. However, it is interesting to note that such a person, with so many vices and faults, manages to advance in society. But this speaks well of the human race, the fact that a harmful individual could benefit from others and enrich themselves at their expense for so long demonstrates that there have been sincere men who trusted them. An artist is admired on stage, but the fraudster brings himself down to disrepute and mistreatment. In striving to appear what he is not, he becomes someone without individuality, without character, and is deprived of influence and power. A sincere man shows a strength of principles, and there is no greater strength, even intellectual, than this. Morality and sincerity are so closely linked that where one is lacking, the other is also absent. A lack of sincerity undermines other virtues, causing them to collapse and lose their importance. It only takes a pinch of insincerity to make a person we once believed to be upright crumble. 
Hypocrisy is such a vulgar vice that no truly upright person, however benevolent or supportive they may be, can afford to dabble with it rather than reinforce it. It transforms the person into someone unreliable, weak and superficial, erasing any previous admiration. Even those who receive false praise will eventually realize that virtue is not what others say about us, but what we do to improve ourselves. Compliments and flattery are fleeting, mere ripples on the surface of our mind. I enjoy his company, says an acquaintance, but I wouldn't marry him, why not, was asked. It seems false to me, was the response. False is a loaded term. It refers to something whose quality does not fully convince us. Its high or false quality does not shine through because it is ambiguous, lukewarm. The same applies to people. Their words and actions have an effect. In speaking, we all emit a kind of silent sound that others detect internally. They know how to distinguish the true from the false. But it is strange that they do not know how they know. Just as the ear can distinguish complex and structured sounds, the inner ear knows how to recognize these subtle and silent sounds. No one is more deceived than the deceiver himself. The insincere, believing themselves superior behind their lies, only end up deceiving themselves. Their actions reveal, without the need for proof, the human heart, which is like a court whose judgments are infallible. This internal infallibility is something common to the entire human race. It is a perfect judgment, so perfect that it, in the realms of literature, art and science, in every branch of knowledge divides the good from the bad, the worthy from the unworthy. Thus, it cherishes the former and rejects the latter. The works of great men are relics of humanity, and humanity cares for their preservation. A thousand men write in a thousand books, but only one work becomes a masterpiece. This one is reserved and cared for, while the rest fade into the background, playing the role of accessory or accompaniment. Ten thousand men utter a phrase in a similar context, but only one is wise and preserved for posterity. It is true that humanity has pursued and killed its prophets, but even this murder is proof that people detect the true. The slain becomes immortal, and the act of his murder is preserved as evidence of his greatness. In the same way that counterfeit coins are perceived, detected and rejected as something unreal and insignificant, so too is false character. Whether things or people, what is false has no value. We are as embarrassed by imitations as we are by those who mimic a foreign accent. Falsehood is cheap. The deceiver becomes a cheap copy, a shadow, a spectre, a mere mask. Truth is precious. The sincere man becomes an example for others. He is a reality, someone to follow. Through falsehood, everything is lost, including individuality. It is important to be authentic, not to want to appear as what we are not, not to simulate any virtue, to adopt no pose or disguise. The hypocrite believes he can deceive the world, but he only deceives one person, himself. According to an old theory, all tyrants are overthrown sooner or later. I think a charlatan is like a tyrant who will be overthrown. He has descended into the hell of resentment and has built an empire based on illusions, lies and deceptions. To think that such a man can thrive is to believe that knees can replace eyes, thus shifting the principles of truth. If someone thinks they can build a successful career based on appearances, they should stop before failing. Deception has no firm ground or substance. It has no hold or foundation on earth. It is like sailing in a canoe without paddles. If there is a low and dark hell, the lowest on earth, it is the hell of insincerity. Four traits characterize the spirit of the sincere person. One, simplicity. Two, charm. Three, sagacity. Four, energy. Simplicity is natural. It means not boasting of false ornaments. Why are all things in nature so beautiful? Because they are natural. We see them as they are, regardless of what they might want to appear. For in reality, they do not want to appear as anything. There is no hypocrisy in the natural world. The flower, beautiful to the eye, is beautiful to everyone. It does not lose its beauty because it is the product of nature. We can find no fault in it, and we are aware of our inability to change anything, even the most insignificant thing. It possesses a particular perfection and unconscious simplicity. One of the modern cries is to return to nature, generally understood as having a country house or a piece of land to cultivate. It will be of no use to go to the countryside if we drag along our deceptions. 
Any resin that clings to us can be removed where we are. It is healthy for those overwhelmed by society to visit the countryside and seek the tranquility of nature, but this is only a slight inner redemption. Humanity has strayed from the natural simplicity of the animal world, but by visiting the countryside, it advances toward a higher, almost divine simplicity. Men of genius are distinguished by their spontaneous simplicity, while inferior minds fixate on style, clothing, and surname. They desire to be noticed on the world stage, and this desire condemns them to mediocrity. Recently a man told me, I would give twenty years of my life to write an immortal song. With such ambition, a man could write nothing. He only wants to pose, think of himself, and his own glory. Before a man can write an immortal composition or create an immortal work, instead of giving twenty years of his life to ambition, he must invest that time in singing, painting, writing, and failing a thousand times, ten thousand times. Thus, he will gain ten thousand joys, preserving his intellect and returning to simplicity. A man becomes great without losing anything. Deceptions recede, revealing the riches of our character. Where there is sincerity, there will always be simplicity, a simplicity of the natural kind. Charm is the direct result of simplicity, which is also observed in the charm of all natural objects. However, in human nature, it manifests as personal influence. In recent years, it is common to find advertisements on how to become personally attractive. In exchange for many dollars, vain people pay to learn how to make themselves attractive in the eyes of others, as if charm could be bought, sold and applied or removed like paint. It is unlikely that these people will be considered attractive because their vanity is an obstacle. The very desire to be seen as attractive is in itself a deception and leads to more deceptions. It also results in these people lacking character and seeking a model, a substitute for their own personality. But there is no substitute for beauty and strength of character. Attraction, like genius, is lost when it is coveted and is found only in those who possess a sincere character. There is nothing in human nature, whether talent, intellect, affection, or beauty of features, that can compare to the solidity of mind and sincerity of heart. There is a perpetual charm in a sincere man or woman, and this represents the best that humanity can offer. There can be no greater personal charm than sincerity. Greed may exist, but it is a kind of disease and is very different from the naturalness of simple people. Excessive greed leads to disillusionment, while in simple people illusions remain solid because they have nothing to hide. Leaders attract by the strength of their sincerity, and their sincerity is a reflection of their great intellect. A man will never be able to lead anything truly authentic if he is not sincere. He may enjoy some popularity for a time, think himself secure, but sooner or later he will fall and be hated by his former supporters. He will not be able to deceive the people for long with his retouched appearance. He will soon be exposed for what he really is. It is like a heavily made-up woman who believes she is admired for her constitution, but everyone knows she is desired only for her appearance. In reality, she has only one true admirer herself, and self-admiration is a burden that causes infernal havoc. Sincere people do not think of themselves or their talent, genius, virtue, or beauty. Being so little aware of themselves, they attract everyone and gain their trust, affection, and esteem. Sagacity belongs to the sincere. No deception survives in their presence. All impostors are transparent to the keen eyes of a sagacious person. With a clear gaze, he sees through their schemes. The fraudsters avoid his gaze. He who has freed his heart from all falsehood and harbors only truth has gained the power to distinguish the false from the true in others. It is impossible to deceive someone who does not deceive themselves. Just as a person, when in nature, recognizes a snake, a bird, a horse, a tree, or a rose, they also recognize the personality of those around them. They perceive a movement, a look, a word, an act. The nature of the other is constantly on alert. They are prepared for the pretentious without being distrustful, acting from optimistic knowledge rather than negative suspicion. People are open to them, and they read their substance. Their judgment focuses on the soul of things. Their conduct reinforces the good in others and provides moral support. Vigorousness goes hand in hand with sagacity. Understanding actions is accompanied by the power to know and handle all actions in the best manner. Knowledge is vigorous, but knowing the nature of actions is a supreme power. 
those who possess it become examples for others and modify their actions for the better. Long after their physical presence has disappeared, they remain a shaping force and are a spiritual reality working subtly in people's minds. At first, their power is limited, but their righteousness continues to expand and grow until it encompasses the entire world, thus influencing all people. The sincere person imprints their character in everything they do and in all the people they interact with. They always express things clearly and impress their listeners. Their influence passes from person to person and can suddenly reach individuals thousands of miles away. Such power cannot be measured in money. Money cannot buy great character, but work can achieve it. Those who forge themselves and acquire inner robustness will become successful and powerful individuals. This has been the pillar of sincerity. Its supportive power is so great that once the temple of prosperity is built, it is more secure. Impartiality and ridding oneself of prejudice is a great accomplishment. Prejudice obstructs a person's path, compromises their health, success, happiness and prosperity, making them continually run against imaginary enemies. When prejudices are removed, these former enemies become allies. Life is indeed an obstacle course for prejudice, a race where the obstacles cannot be circumvented and the goal is not achieved. For the impartial person, however, life is like a walk in a pleasant region. To be impartial, a person must eliminate the egoism that prevents them from seeing things from different angles. It is indeed a difficult task, but also remarkable. Truth can move mountains, and prejudice is like a line of mountains that hide the fighter or explorer. However, once these mountains are removed, the panorama clears, and the mental richness, tempered by a glorious tableau of light, color, and tone, delights the view. By clinging to obstinate prejudices, how many joys are lost, how many friends are sacrificed, how much happiness is destroyed. Yet being free of prejudice is rare. Few men do not have prejudices about the subjects that interest them. Rarely does one find someone who discusses a subject they care about disinterestedly. They do not seek the truth because they are already convinced that their own conclusion is the truth and that everything else is error. They defend their own point of view and fight for victory. They do not attempt to prove they hold the truth with facts and evidence, but defend their position with warmth and agitation. Prejudice leads us to draw conclusions without factual basis or knowledge, and then to refuse to consider anything that does not support our conclusion. In this way, prejudice is a barrier to acquiring knowledge. It chains a person to darkness and ignorance, preventing their mind from moving towards higher directions. It also excludes them from the best minds and confines them in the dark cell of their egoism. Prejudice is like closing off access to light, beauty and listening to better sounds. Prejudice clings to its fleeting and fragile little opinion, thinking it is the best in the world. It is so in love with its own conclusion that it is only self-love, believing that all men should agree with it and considering as foolish those who do not see as it does. Such a person cannot have knowledge, they are confined to giving their opinion on everything and nothing without ever reaching true understanding. They are so enamored with themselves that they cannot see the most common facts of life, while their own theories, generally unfounded, occupy an enormous and disproportionate place in their mind. They imagine that there is only one side to everything, and that side is theirs. There are at least two sides to every issue, and the one who discovers the truth on a subject is the one who examines its sides freely and without any desire to argue. In controversies and debates, the world is like two lawyers defending a case. The prosecutor presents facts that support their side, while the defense attorney presents facts that support their argument, each despising or ignoring the facts of the other. The judge of the case is, however, like the impartial party. Having heard all the evidence from both sides, they compare and filter it to make the fairest decision. It is not that all partiality is inherently bad. As with all extremes, conflict generates results, sometimes a perfect balance between things. Furthermore, it is an evolutionary factor that stimulates reflection, critique and argumentation in people who have not yet developed these abilities. It is a phase that all men must go through, but it is merely a winding, tortuous and painful path to the highway of truth. It is the mechanism that drives impartiality. Prejudice sees a part of the truth and thinks it is the whole, 
but the impartial thinker examines the truth from all angles. The impartial person examines, weighs, and considers, and is free from likes and dislikes. Their sole desire is to discover the truth. They eliminate preconceived opinions and let the facts and evidence speak for themselves. They do not need to defend themselves, as they know that truth is immutable and can be investigated and discovered. Thus, they free themselves from much of the nervous wear and tear to which the debater or polemicist is subjected. Moreover, they look directly at reality and become calm and peaceful. So rare is freedom from prejudice that wherever an impartial thinker lives, it is certain that they will eventually occupy a very high position in the world's esteem. Not necessarily a position in worldly affairs, but a position of great influence. They might be a carpenter, a tailor, or an office worker. They might live in poverty or be a millionaire. They might be of small or great stature, or of any other constitution. Regardless, they have begun to move the world, and will one day be recognized as a new force, a forger of evolution. There was one more than a thousand years ago. He was just a poor carpenter and scholar, whom his parents and neighbors considered a fool. He met an infamous end in the eyes of his compatriots, but he sowed the seeds of a religion that transformed the entire world. There was another in India about twenty-five centuries ago. He was an educated and learned man, the son of a small capitalist and landowner, who became a beggar with no money or home. To this day a third of the human race worships him, and his influence grows every year. Beware when God releases a thinker into the world, says Emerson. A person is not a thinker if they are bound by prejudice. They are merely the defender of an opinion. Just as each idea must overcome the barriers of its prejudices, impartial judgment becomes impossible. Such a person sees everything only in relation to their opinion, whereas the thinker sees things as they are. The person who has purified their mind of prejudice and egoism can look directly at reality and reach the pinnacle of power. They possess, so to speak, a vast influence and will exercise this power wisely. Truth will be in their words, in their actions, in their body postures, even in their silence and the tranquility of their body, wherever they go. They cannot escape their elevated destiny, for a great thinker is the center of the world. Through them, all men keep their feet on the ground, for thought gravitates around them. The true thinker lives above the whirlwind of passions in which humanity is immersed. They are not swayed by personal considerations, for they understand the importance of principles. Not participating in any war, they benefit from the advantageous position of an impartial but not indifferent observer, which allows them to see both sides equally and understand the cause and meaning of the quarrel. Not only the great masters, but also the most prominent figures in literature stand out for their freedom from prejudice, as if they had built in mirrors. They see things impartially. Such are Whitman, Shakespeare, Balzac, Emerson, Homer. These minds are no longer local but universal. Their attitude is cosmic, not personal. They understand all beings, all things and laws, like beacons guiding the human race toward a serene and safe land. The true thinker is the greatest of men, and their destiny is the most exalted. The impartial mind reaches incredible heights and rejoices in the light of reality. The four great elements of impartiality are justice, patience, calm, wisdom. Justice consists of giving and receiving values equally. What is called making a good deal is actually a form of theft, as it means the buyer values only part of their purchase while appropriating the rest of the goods. The seller also encourages this by closing the deal. The just person does not seek an advantage. They consider the true values of things and adjust their transactions accordingly. They do not let profit come before what is just, knowing that in the end what is just yields better results. They do not seek their own benefit at the expense of another, as they know that a just action benefits both parties in a transaction. If one's loss is another's gain, it is only so that the balance can be adjusted later. Unjust profits do not lead to prosperity, but are destined for failure. A just person could not take the gains of others, as in a smart transaction each party's benefit is sought. Taking advantage of someone would make them feel like a pickpocket. The business mind sometimes respects the spirit of commerce less. It is rather a selfish mindset that wants to get something for nothing. The upright person keeps their business free from haggling and builds it on the basis of justice. They provide a good product at its fair price without altering it. They do not soil their hands with shady dealings or frauds. Their products are authentic and priced appropriately. 
Customers who try to take advantage of a merchant degrade themselves. Their practice implies one of two things. Either the merchant is dishonest and charges too much, which is a low and suspicious attitude, or they are eager to deceive the merchant into losing their profit, a similarly vile attitude, to benefit from their loss. The practice of imposing is dishonest, and those who practice it the most are often the ones who complain the most about being imposed upon, which is surprising because they themselves try to impose on others. On the other hand, a merchant who is eager to sell everything to their customers without regard for justice and correct values is a sort of thief. They slowly poison their success as their actions will surely come back in the form of financial ruin. This is what a 50-year-old man told me. I just discovered that throughout my life, I paid 50% more than I should have. A just person cannot feel they have ever paid too much for something, as they do not engage in transactions they consider unjust. But if a person is eager to get everything at half price, they will always lament paying double for everything. The just person delights in paying the true value of everything, whether they give or receive, and their mind carries no guilt. People should avoid pettiness and strive to become increasingly perfect and just. If one is unjust, they cannot be honest or generous with anyone. In fact, they become a sort of disguised thief, seeking to get all they can while giving as little as possible. A person must avoid all forms of haggling and conduct their business with dignity. Patience is the brightest jewel in a person's character. To be patient is to be like a child building a toy. It is to act with constant gentleness and a kind spirit. To be patient is to work in the most difficult circumstances while showing kindness. It is a rare quality, true, and not everyone in the world can be expected to have it. But it is a virtue that can be achieved progressively. Even partial patience can work wonders in a person's life. An irritable person is doomed to disaster. Who wants to do business with someone who explodes like dynamite at the slightest problem? Who seeks the company of a person who insults and attacks at the first misunderstanding? A person must begin to control themselves and discover the beautiful lessons that patience can offer. Thus, they can be prosperous, useful, and powerful. They must learn to think of others, and not just of themselves, to be considerate and understanding. They must study how to remain calm with people who differ from them and avoid disputes as one would avoid a deadly poison. Disagreements will continually affect them, but they must strengthen themselves against them and learn to make the best of them. Dispute poisons the mind, while patience enriches the heart and beautifies the spirit. Everyone can spit and speak ill. It requires no effort. It takes people who remain calm in all circumstances, who are meticulous and patient with others' flaws. Patience triumphs in the end. Just as water wears away the hardest rock, patience overcomes all opposition. Tranquility is the companion of patience. It is a great and prestigious quality, the haven of peace that souls find after a brutal storm. It is the reward for the person who has suffered greatly, endured and experienced, and who eventually triumphs. One who is agitated cannot be impartial. Excitement, prejudice and partiality arise from troubled minds. When minds are disturbed, they rise and bubble like stagnant water. The calm person avoids this disturbance by channeling their feelings and making them impersonal. They think and feel for others what they feel for themselves. They give the same value to others' opinions as to their own. If they consider their work important, they also recognize that others' work is important. They do not content themselves with their own merit and the failures of their colleagues. They are not like Humpty Dumpty, who is defeated by too great a self-esteem. They have set aside egoism and perceive the true meaning of things. They have conquered irritability and realize there is nothing worth getting angry about. Getting angry at someone because they do not think like you is as absurd as getting angry at a stone for not being a rose. Minds differ and the calm person recognizes these differences as facts of human nature. The calm and impartial person is not only happy, but also possesses many powers. They are sure, swift, and achieve silently what the irritable cannot, no matter how much they work. Their mind is clear, balanced, and ready to tackle whatever they undertake. In the calm mind, contradictions fade, and joyful peace manifests. As Emerson says, Tranquility is a fixed and habitual joy. One should not confuse indifference with tranquility, for they are opposites. Indifference is linear and flat, while tranquility is radiant and luminous.
The calm person has partially or completely dominated their ego and successfully battles internal selfishness. They know how to find and overcome it. The calm person is always a victor as long as they maintain their calm. Defeat is impossible. Self-control is a form of enrichment, and tranquility is a permanent blessing. Wisdom corresponds to the wise. Their advice guides them, and their standards protect them. Wisdom has an infinite number of faces. The wise act for their own good, but never violate the ethical principles of correct conduct. The foolish man cannot adapt to any of wisdom's faces. He acts only for himself, and continually breaks ethical principles. There is wisdom in every act of impartiality, and once a person discovers the impartial zone, they wish to visit it again and again until they finally establish themselves there. Every thought, word, and act of wisdom always speaks of the world and its mysteries. Wisdom is a well of knowledge, a source of power. It is deep and vast and encompasses the smallest details, neglecting not even the most minute things. Wisdom is like the world. It contains all things in their place and in order, and it is not overwhelmed by anything. It is free and unaware of any limitation. However, it is never slack, never wandering, never regretful. Wisdom is to be firm and mature, while ignorance is like being a capricious child. The wise man has overcome weakness and dependence, mistakes and childish whims. The understanding mind does not need the support or help of others. It supports itself on the ground of knowledge, not the knowledge of books, but that of experience. It has seen various minds and people and knows them as such. It has traveled through hearts and experienced strong doses of joy and sadness. When wisdom reaches a person, they rise to incredible heights, becoming a new being with new goals and powers, and inhabiting a universe where they fulfill a glorious destiny. It is the pillar of impartiality that adds immense strength and grace to beautify the temple of prosperity. Autonomy. Every young person should read Emerson's essay on autonomy. It is the most energetic essay ever written, designed to cure two common mental diseases of youth, self-contempt and arrogance. Moreover, it reveals to the remedy seeker the smallness and futility of their vanity and shows the timid person the weakness of their character. It is a revealing study on human dignity, as revealing as those produced by the ancient prophets, and perhaps more practical and grounded in its time, coming from a modern prophet of a new type of person, a pioneer. Its main merit is its powerful, stimulating quality. Self-confidence should not be confused with presumption. There is nothing petty about self-sufficiency, while presumption brings nothing but failure. The person who never says, I don't know, when asked about topics they are ignorant of, to avoid appearing ignorant, will be known for their ignorance and poorly regarded for their pedantry. An honest confession of ignorance inspires respect, while an arrogant presumption of knowledge provokes disdain. The timid person who seems afraid even to live, who fears doing something that might not be approved and could ridicule them, is not fulfilled. They must imitate others and never act with independence. They need self-confidence to make their own decisions and thus become an example rather than a servile imitator of someone else. As for ridicule, those who act to avoid it will never be happy. The arrows of mockery and sarcasm cannot penetrate the armor of the self-sufficient person. Sharp arrows of insult may rain upon them, but they are deflected by the strong armor of their confidence. Emerson says, Trust yourself, every heart vibrates to that iron string. Through the centuries, men have leaned and continue to lean on artifices instead of resting on their own simplicity and dignity. Those who had the courage to do so have been noticed and then elevated to the rank of heroes. The true hero is the one who has the courage to let their nature speak for itself, who possesses that iron string that allows them to rely on themselves. The candidate for such heroism must endure many trials. They must not be ashamed of their ideas and decisions, nor fear for their reputation or status, nor for their religion or prestige. They must learn to act and live independently of these superficial considerations. However, once they have overcome this trial and prestige or hatred has failed to impress them, they will have become a good person, someone whom society will eventually consider and admire. Sooner or later, people will seek the self-sufficient person, even if the greatest minds do not hold them in high regard. They respect and value their work and worth and recognize their status as a good person. Despising learning should not be considered a synonym for self-confidence. 
Such an attitude stems from stubborn arrogance and weakness, not from the strength and great achievements characteristic of self-confidence. Pride and vanity should not be associated with self-confidence, as they rest on superficial elements, money, clothes, property, prestige, etc. Accessory goods, which, if lost, also lead to the downfall of the presumed self-esteem and vanity. Self-confidence is based on essentials and moral principles, integrity, purity, sincerity, character, truth. What can be lost is of little importance. Pride hides its ignorance through ostentation and is unwilling to be seen as a beginner. Everywhere it relies on ignorance and appearance, and the higher it rises, the louder its fall. Self-confidence has nothing to hide, as it is always ready to learn. There can be no humility where there is pride. Self-confidence and humility are compatible and even complementary, and the highest form of self-confidence is associated with the deepest humility. Asterisk, asterisk. Extremes meet, says Emerson, and there is no better example than the greatness of humility. No aristocrat, no prince born into opulence, can compare to the self-regard of a saint. He is humble because he knows he can afford it, as he relies on the greatness of God. It is Buddha who, in this regard, said, Those who now or after my death will be a lamp for themselves, self-reliant and not depending on any external aid, clinging to the truth as to their lamp and seeking salvation in the truth, they are the ones who will reach the highest altitude. But one must be willing to always learn. This saying, where the emphasis on self-confidence and the constant desire to learn is reiterated, is the best I know in this regard. The great master understands the balance between confidence and humility that one must acquire. Self-confidence is the essence of heroism. All great men have relied on themselves. We should use them as examples, not as idols. A great man who relies on no one and accomplishes things previously considered impossible is quickly idolized by the world, which then uses him as an excuse for not achieving anything. This is a self-destructive illusion. It is better to hide our vices within great men than to support our virtues with their brilliant light. If we rely on the light of others, it might go out and then we would remain in darkness. But if we rely on our own light, we only need to keep it burning. We can draw light from others and rekindle our own, but taking it all amounts to condemning our lamp to abandonment and corrosion. Our own light is the one that will never fail us. What is the inner light of pioneers, if not their own self-sufficiency? We must rely on what we are, not on what others think of us. I am so small and poor, you might say, but rejoice in this smallness and you will soon become great. A child must suckle and cling, but an adult no longer must. Henceforth they stand on their own legs. There are people who beg God to give them what they are destined to achieve, to provide them with their daily bread. At some point, these people overcome this spiritual childhood. There will come a time when men will no longer pay a priest to pray for them. The main problem of man is a lack of self-confidence. That is why those who have confidence in themselves become a rare and singular sight. If a man considers himself a worm, what can come of it? He who humbles himself will be exalted, but he who degrades himself will be trampled upon doubly. A man must see himself as he is, and if there is any unworthiness in him, he must rid himself of it. Thus, he will have confidence in his worth. A man degrades himself when he despises himself. He is exalted when he leads a lofty life. Why should a person with low self-esteem constantly highlight and expose their flaws? There is in them a false humility that glorifies its own defects. If someone feels they have stumbled in life, it is so they can rise again and become wiser. If a man falls into a pit, he does not stay there drawing attention to his situation. He gets up and continues his path. Similarly, if someone falls into vice, they must rise, cleanse themselves, and continue their life. There is no area in life that does not improve and thrive with a certain amount of self-sufficiency. For the master, whether skeptical or religious, just as for managers, supervisors, and all those in command positions, self-sufficiency is an indispensable ingredient. The four great qualities of self-sufficiency are 1. Decision 2. Firmness 3. Dignity 4. Independence Decision makes a man strong. One who avoids it has a weak character. A man who is to play a role, even a small one, in the drama of life must be decisive and understand what that role entails. No matter the doubts, he must not doubt his power to act. He must know his role in life and put all his energy into it. 
he must have a solid foundation of knowledge to work and help himself. Perhaps he is just a salesman delivering products, but he must know his job thoroughly and make it known that he does. He must be ready at any moment to respond when his work is questioned. He must be well prepared to avoid doubt in times of emergency. There is a proverb that says, the man who doubts is lost. To some extent, this proves true. No one has confidence in someone who does not have confidence in himself, who stops and hesitates at every moment and cannot rid himself of indecision. Who would want to deal with a merchant who does not know the price of his goods and does not even know where to find them? A man must know his business. If he does not know his own, who will teach him? He must be able to give a good account of his knowledge. He must have that hint of self-sufficiency that only competence and experience confer. Certainty is a great element of self-confidence. To be important, a man must have knowledge to convey, and every skill is a communication of that knowledge. He must speak with authority and not like an apprentice. He must master something and know that he has mastered it. In this way, he can explain it with clarity and understanding like a master, and thus cease to be the eternal apprentice. Indecision is a cause of disintegration. A minute of hesitation can derail the current of success. Men who fear making decisions for fear of making mistakes almost always make mistakes when they act. Those who act most swiftly are less prone to error. It is better to act with decisiveness and make a mistake than to act with indecision and make several mistakes. One gains more from a wrong decision than from indecision. A man must always be decisive, whether in what he knows or in what he does not. He must be ready to say no and to say yes, whether to acknowledge his ignorance or to share his knowledge. If he relies on facts and acts with honesty, he will not find barriers to stop him. Decide and act with assurance. Train your mind and your decisions will be instinctive and spontaneous. Firmness emerges in a mind that is quick to decide. Make a definitive decision on the best direction to follow, and the best path is that of the safety of remaining steadfast in one's principles, whatever happens. It is not necessary for the decision to be written or spoken. Knowledge that is correct, tested and wise is sufficient for those decisions to be firm. One must have a solid foundation to rely on. One cannot remain in the swamp of hesitation. Instability, lack of firmness is a vice of weakness, and the vices of weakness erode character, the vicious man often resorts to shortcuts to avoid the truth. When one understands that power can be used for both good and ill purposes, it is not surprising that alcoholics and prostitutes are better remembered than religious or political figures. At least, they have been steadfast in the path they chose, however vile it may be, and decision is a force. It takes that same force to move from evil to good, and thus the vicious man transforms and changes direction. A man must have a fixed and determined mind. He must adhere to those principles that help him remain steadfast in the face of difficulties, guide him through the maze of opinions and give him courage in the battle of life. These principles must be more important than his gains and even than happiness itself. If he never abandons them, he will find that they will never abandon him. They will protect him from his enemies and dangers and illuminate his path through darkness. They will be a light in the darkness, a place of rest and a refuge from the conflicts of the world. Dignity is like an elegant attire for the firm mind, one who is as rigid as a steel bar against vice and evil, and as flexible as a wand in becoming acquainted with good, carries with him a dignity that soothes and comforts others by its presence. The unstable mind, which is anchored to no fixed principle, tardy, and yields when its well-being is at stake, has neither gravity nor balance, much less a solid stance. A dignified man cannot be trampled or subdued, for he is incapable of trampling or submitting himself. He immediately disarms, with a look or a clear word, any attempt to demean him. His presence alone is a lesson to the sarcastic and mocking, while being an example of strength for those who admire him. The main reason a dignified man commands respect is not because he respects himself, but because he treats everyone with kindness and esteem. The arrogant only love themselves and treat their subordinates with disdain and arrogance. When self-love and pride meet, they only generate arrogant and detestable people. True dignity does not stem from self-love, but from self-sacrifice, that is, from the impartiality with which we apply our principles. The dignity of a judge emerges when, in performing his duty, he sets aside all personal bias and bases his decisions solely on the law. 
his fleeting personal personality becomes insignificant, while the law, impersonal and enduring, becomes everything. If a judge, in rendering his verdict, deviates from the law and lets his prejudices guide him, he would lose his dignity. By sacrificing his dignity, he becomes one among the multitude of the reckless and undisciplined. Every man will have dignity to the extent that he acts from a stable principle. It suffices that the principle is correct, and thus he will be impregnable. As long as a man obeys this principle and does not waver, passions, prejudices and interests, no matter how powerful, will be weak and ineffective against his strength and incorruptibility. Independence is like a birthright of the strong and self-controlled man. All men love and fight for freedom. All aspire to some form of freedom. A man must work for himself or for the community. Unless he is invalid or prodigal, he should be ashamed to depend on others without giving anything in return. If someone thinks that living under conditions of freedom is acceptable, they should know that it is one of the lowest forms of slavery. There comes a time when being a parasite in the human hive, a bloated parasite, only evokes contempt and rejection from decent people. Independence and freedom come from work, not idleness, and the self-sufficient man is too strong and honourable to depend on others. To return to being a child of the mother, one earns with one's hands or intelligence the right to live as a free and productive citizen. This principle also applies to those who are born rich, as wealth is not an excuse for idleness, but rather a great opportunity to work for the good of the community. One who sustains oneself remains free, self-sufficient, independent. Thus, one understands the nature of the eight pillars, the foundations on which the structure rests, how they are built, their ingredients, the nature of the material used and how they support the temple of prosperity. Anyone can now build it. Those who previously knew them halfway can now explain them perfectly. Those who knew them very well, obeyed them, and cultivated them live a happy and prosperous life. Let us now consider the temple itself to understand the power of its pillars, the solidity of its walls, the resistance of its roof, and the architectural beauty of the whole.